Okay, so the stage is here. Oops. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. And I will uh, start. Uh, first of all, uh, I will share my whole screen because uh, I will switch a lot between different windows uh, at first. So let me start from the beginning and uh, let me start from the tools. Uh, one of the most complicated things in Kotlin ecosystem is the for beginners, I mean, it's a Gradle, the build system. I will show you how to set up the actual project. Uh, but uh, in order to save time, because we will have we would have an hour hour to just go through the setup, we will work with the Jupyter notebook. As far as I understand, most of your people are from have some kind of Python background, so it will be easier for them. So. We will be using these nice things called Kotlin Jupyter kernel. And you see the repository here. And you see very nice installation instructions here. So you, you will have only to use one line to, to set up. Let uh, us, I've already set this up. And now I will just launch the Jupyter lab. And it will start. While it is starting, and it's pretty fast. And you can see that I have uh, this Kotlin kernel here, and I can start a uh, Kotlin notebook and uh, just use it. And it will work. Uh, another way, uh, a little pause here because the GVM and the kernel needs to be started, and it takes some time collapse system uh while yeah no no, no kernel what happened surprise found something broken uh while it is starting i will show you another way to set this up without your local jupyter notebook for this, you have to have a Datalore account. Datalore is JetBrains surprise uh, product, and they have um, uh, Kotlin also available. You can um, just start any notebook, like Python notebook. And then uh, here you have a library mentioned, and uh, you can, for example, Kotlin Jupyter kernel, find, find it here, and you can install it. Uh, I have it installed, but you can install it via pip or whatever, or update it. And then you can go and start up this actual Kotlin kernel. Uh, I created a project right for us today. And here it is. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, there, are, there, are, there are some problems with the Jupyter kernel anyway. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I have updated right now, so probably pro uh, some kind of problem with it. So I will stick to that all right now. In your Jupyter kernels, probably everything is fine, so you can just use them. And uh, this is all the setup we need today. <sighs> just for um, the completeness of our tutorial, I will also show you how to set up project in idea. You see this idea and I just do a new project. Hey, okay. And now I select the uh, directory where I want to put this and I have this um, uh, list casus coroutines directory and uh, I let us call it the idea. It won't start with the um, existing application, and then I just select Kotlin uh, application. That's all. Uh, we do not. We can. We can adjust things here, but we actually do not need it. And we just click next, and let it be this one, and finish. And here it is. Uh, in order to use coroutines, you need to adjust something state here. Uh, 
for example, you need to add a dependency. Right? It says something on UHL Chrome. Let me fix it. Yeah, no, it's okay. So uh, we need to add a dependency on coroutines because uh, unlike things like Python, uh, coroutines are uh, not in the standard library. They're in a separate library and we need to add this. For that, we are going to the Kotlinx coroutines repository here. It's a huge library or several libraries uh, about coroutines, about asynchronous programming. And we need to skip to this Gradle installation and just copy this line here and paste it to our dependencies block. And that's all. After that, all we need, oh, it's in a new Kotlin version. Don't bother. Uh, after that, we need just to need to synchronize configuration and uh, it will be available to us. But anyway, I'm just telling you how to load it in the, in the idea and that's all we need to do to use it in the idea. But I will try to stick to the Jupyter um, today uh, for the sake of convenience. Mm. Ah, it's a Zoom window I can't switch. Uh, for some reason, it's still... The Kotlin kernel is still broken here. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. I probably need to restart it. Uh, to save time, just let, let's stick to the mm, data log. Uh, so that's all for setup. Uh, if you have any question about the setup, uh, please ask them now because I want to go back and uh, talk a little bit about the basics, about what are the core teams, what is the uh, parallel programming, what is an asynchronous programming, what is concurrency. By the way, uh, is there a lot of people here who, hey, uh, how, how can I switch? How can I switch back? Uh, is there a lot of people here who understand the difference between parallel programming and uh, asynchronous programming? Do you have any ideas about that? Maybe some comments. No, no comments. So I should. Maybe we can give a short. Uh... Yes, yes, I, I think that I should because it's a very. A uh, very common um, problem for people to understand what is the difference. So let's start. Uh, people tend to think that asynchronous in parallel is the same, and uh, but it's quite a different things. And also there is a concurrent programming and non-concurrent programming. Basically, I can show it this way. Uh, let's assume they have a timeline. Uh, like this with the program, you're working, like do something, then do something else, then do something well, like statements like A, B, C, like you do it in C or in Python, and that's okay. But now let us assume that you also have some processes which do not, uh, th this, this is what we call synchronous. So even if you call some external process. For example, in order to get C, you need to make a request to the network. Some kind of question in chat. Just uh -huh. writing so people can copy paste the- Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, just uh, add a space. Uh, ah, no, not space, yes. Uh, I will explain what, 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 what is doing right. Uh, so let us assume that in order to do C, you need to make a request to the server and get uh, some evaluation in the server and, uh, and request the data. So you're doing request, you're making the response and you're waiting while this response D is being evaluated. In this case, we're still not breaking the timeline because uh, C is directly after B all the time and C is after D. This is what we called synchronous call. 
some kernels mean we are waiting until it finished and not breaking the timeline. Another, another case, let us see another case. Uh, for example, we have a work uh, which requires like A, then it's uh, C, and for C we need to make several operations uh, which work um, at the same time in different cores, but do not interfere with each other. In this case, we're doing like this. And we have a B1, B2, B3, B4, and whatever. This is a simple case of synchronous but parallel computation. Synchronous because we have still the same order of execution. C is always after B, B is always after A, uh, but it's, it's done in parallel. It's actually a typical case you have, say, in uh, scientific computing when you want to evaluate something you know, on a list in parallel to utilize the processing power. But it's still it's synchronous. Another case, uh, let us see the case when we have a uh, asynchronous but single thread computation. For example, uh, uh, there's a, a then we are doing B. And uh, for example, then we are doing C. In this case, what, what we are doing in, from A, we call uh, a process B. And when the B is finished, it calls process C. A then doesn't know anything about C. Uh, of course, we have some kind of timeline here, but actually we can do something like D here. In this case, even if we work on the same thread, we can make a scheduler which will work on the same thread and B and C will um, in the same process or thread or whatever, uh, you can synchronize C and D because they work in different timelines. So you can't say, do something when C is finished in D because you don't know when it will be finished. This we call asynchronous. And of course, asynchronous computations could be both single thread and parallel. And you probably all, all uh, know the example of uh, uh, environment where you have uh, asynchronity, but not parallel computation. Python, for example, Python have a thing called GIL, Global Interpreter Log. You probably know what it is. If you do not know, I can spend uh, 30 seconds to explain. But in Python, due to this limitation of the language itself, you can't do parallel computations inside the language, but you do can do asynchronous computations. And they have even some reserved keywords for that, you know, uh, like Python and JavaScript. The whole program is asynchronous because it's a callback uh, for the uh, DOM, uh, document object model rendering. I mean, when you start a page, you can't just start the logic in JavaScript. You need to wait while, while a document object model is loaded. And it is done asynchronously. So you need to create a callback, like in this picture, uh, which is performed when the sum operation, previous operation performed. This is a very important thing. And uh, this is a difference between asynchronous computations and parallel computations. Uh, I can say that Cotton Curtains is a framework for asynchronous computation. You can do parallel things in there and I will show you later. So you can uh, distribute uh, tasks uh, between different cores, but it's not the primary aim or the framework. Primary aim is asynchronity. And uh, this one you should understand. If you just want things like this, uh, probably uh, you can do this with coroutines, but it's it's not the actual target case of coroutines. You probably uh, should stick with the uh, Java 8 stream, streaming API, which allows uh, parallel processing of collections in a much more concise way. If you want, I can show you this as well, but it has nothing to do with coroutines. Okay. 
now we've done that and we are going back to our code if you have questions please ask them oh, no questions so far okay so we are going back to this thing and let's understand what what's happening here uh i just mm, uh, uh use these uh, descriptors to add coordinates to my project this one is not necessary in general the problem with this because i use this shortcut for coordinates just few few days ago it is not uh, it is possible it is not in the uh, your distribution of uh, the plugin yet so just in case i urge the uh, cotton jupyter plugin to update um, descriptors before run and we just run it uh, and here it is it's completed no, no, no errors uh, and just to be concise here what i have here is a another way to load coroutines so in cotton jupyter kernel you can load libraries just via the address on marvin central or whatever repository you like so this one and this one do exactly the same in this case some plugins some libraries like data frame library does a lot of other things uh, uh, under the hood but in this case we can just uh, see the description it is exactly the same so let us start with the um, mm, uh, actually i wanted to start with the um, callbacks and probably it's a bit good idea to do just that let us start with the callbacks let us create a function uh, which does uh, something after it's finished um do something uh, by the way i, I can share uh, dynamically uh, uh this link uh, where where is my chat where is my chat i can just share it and you can just use it uh, see what what i'm doing and copy the code and whatever do something with callback uh and uh, in order to do something in the callback i need to pass a callback as a parameter here and i'm doing like that callback and in kotlin i have a first class support for functions so i'm doing just function like that uh, and the function uh, uh, this type of function is the function which takes no arguments and uh does uh, and have no result and then i do think like thread uh, sleep and uh, wait for 100 milliseconds emulating some kind of work i'm doing and then i do callback that's all and then i can just uh add another cell it's compiled and then i do uh, can just call this function do something with callback and you see it's automatically created with brackets i mean uh, i can pass a function again uh, if you're at least somehow familiar with code and you know what it is if you know, do not know please ask question and i will ask uh, yeah they they are not familiar so um, most of okay. people are not familiar with cutting so we just can give an, a quick explanation what's a, a lambda and uh, yes uh here i'm passing function here as a parameter in kotlin if you have a, a last argument of the function uh, last argument of the function is a function then uh, i can do it the old way like you do in java for example or python it's more or less the same and pass the function here and uh i can do this and the let me do it in python way yeah val call back uh, and it is uh, the type of this thing is uh, the same you are not you are not obliged to uh, uh, use this type but it's it's much better because you control what you pass and this can get green uh, finish finish and then i pass this callback and let us run the cell yeah 
it's done. Uh, and we can uh, even um, do it a little bit more complex. And for example, we want to measure uh, the time of this uh, inner process and pass it as a, a result of our computation. Um, let us uh, val time uh, measure 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 whatever where where it is mm. yeah well what happened I don't remember what else yeah. hmm? uh probably I need some kind of input for that and for that I will need to use ah uh, how to get this zoom window out Okay, I will just need to help a little bit help with it because an idea I have this hint and I do not have it in this, but it's easy, quite easy. Uh, Kotlin measure time milis. Here is, is it, and I can just see uh, oh, where it is located. It's a source and it's Kotlin system. Hmm. I should see it. So it's, it's a little bit strange. Uh, maybe it is just a bug of uh, type hint. Okay, it's probably working. Yes. Uh, so now I modify a callback that will take a, a time in millis milliseconds, which will uh, the, take this operation to do, and then use it here. And let, let us try to run this code. Oops. Why, 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 this not, why, why it is not working? Uh, why it is not working? I copy it. For some reason, it does not. It's a whole thing. Let's try to use a, a fully qualified name. Maybe it's a problem. Yeah, uh, the problem is I need to do an import here. I'm rarely using the Jupyter kernel, so I'm forgetting to put imports. Uh, and here it is, and I, then I can use it without, without clarifier. Okay, uh, now we have this function, and now we are passing function, which will, if I call it now, it will be a error because it's the wrong type. Uh, what, 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 what happened? Uh, yeah, okay, it's, it's not a problem because I can pass function which take no argument in, instead of, ah, yes. And okay, but to do it correctly, I need to do it this way. And uh, it is the uh, default argument. Yes, there it is. Now, now, now it's working properly. I can even do it there. Okay. And very very but in way for you to understand what happens here it's a default name of the single argument so uh, what what we do is a basic uh, basic asynchronous computation because this thing is done we don't know when we, it's done when we call this function we do not control uh, what will what will be done and when it will be done and basically it works uh, like charm in Kotlin. of course nobody does it like this because as I already said, there is a shortcut which allows you um, to let, let it be here. We won't just use it. Uh, in Kotlin, you can do it just like this. And we'll do exactly the same. In Kotlin, you can pass the body of the last lambda as an argument it's very convenient if you want to do this like map, map reduce way so that's all uh you, we have a callback but the problem arises if we have this function which also wants to take callbacks 
for example, you need to do this and then to, for example, uh, call another function here, the same, for example. And you hear two times. And then this callback will take another callback and another callback. If anybody uh, seen the JavaScript uh, web, I mean, web, web application in JavaScript sometime, you probably did, yeah? You saw this like this. So it's, a, it's a, just a chain of a lot of callbacks. And it is a problem because it's very hard to write and it's very hard to read and it's very hard to understand what happens here. So this is a problem curtains are made to solve. Uh, it's called, uh, in science, it's called a curtain passing style. But the idea is that you uh, force your compiler to search for these blocks, which passed as a callback. And then instead, you uh, write those fragments sequentially. So let's do the same, but in uh, curtain style. Uh, for that, we will need to use a keyword suspend uh, because um, it allows a compiler to know this, this function should be subjected to um, this uh, compiler plugin, which uh, works with the coroutines. And we do um, suspend fun do something with coroutines. And we do not need to use a callback here. We just, uh, for example, we mm, do it. And we can even return a value. And we are writing and we're using return here. And if you have some at least some experience with Kotlin, we, you, you will see that nobody actually does this. And you can do it simpler, for example, by replacing it with a equals. It looks better. And here we are, we are compiling it. And it's fine, it's compiled. So now we have this function and all we need to do is call it and and then perform your action. And to this, we need to enter this coroutine world, this asynchronous computation world. So for that, we in this case, we will use a run blocking. I will explain a bit, little bit later what it does. And what we do is uh, do something with coroutines, and uh, then uh, we use uh, result, and then we just, mm, Print it. That's all. Let's just run it. Yeah, that's all. You see, the result uh, is the same. More, even more. This this result is actually looking like the synchronous code because uh, we know that this happens directly after this one. But actually, if you do a more complicated logic, you will see that it is not. Uh, we can do it, for example, by mm, launching additional coroutine inside this one. And uh, let's let us do that. Launch uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Launch. Uh, we launch conditional coaches and mm, uh, start it. In this case, you see that it's very interesting because you've started the process and the finished file before the things the, the things launched. Uh, Maybe a bit, but, but the print is here. So uh, confusion. First, we did this operation, and then this is this operation. This is because, as I said, it's a very important to understand different asynchronous process, asynchronous processes are 
in different timelines. When you're creating a new core team with a launch, you're entering the different timeline and you can directly control which, uh, uh, what is the time difference between this timeline. You know, this fantasy uh, novels when your people are going to different worlds and they have different time uh, pace there. It's exactly the same. And you, can, you can't know when you will return. So uh, this is not all what we want to, of course, that, that's not all, it's on every basic, but we also can do things uh, more complicated. For example, why, why are we, do we need core teams? We need core teams to, for several reasons. We need simple asynchronous primitives. We need to work with the network requests, data analysis, responses, uh, database, et cetera, et cetera. And we also need a way to create uh, different analysis, different timelines without creating a threads because, because thread are, threads are very expensive. In Java, for example, a single thread is an additional two megabytes of a memory and additional processing power to the spatial team. And it, it, it takes some time to create, to copy the, all the context from one thread to another. And in C++, you're mostly working with, not with threads, but with processes which are even more expensive. Uh, in Python, you also work with processes because you do not have threads in Python. And in JavaScript, you need to create these web workers, which are completely separate program. You can't, you can't uh, launch several simultaneous computation in JavaScript without creating web worker and web worker needs to be uh, written completely in completely different file. Otherwise you can't use it. So uh, for uh, web application is very important because mm, say you have uh, thousands of clients uh, connecting simultaneously to your site. Let, let's uh, say you spend two megabytes to, for each thread mm, for each client and you will have a uh, uh, two gigabytes, oh, no, yeah, two gigabytes, two gigabytes two gigabytes of memory only to maintain all those processes, only to, without any inner logic. So it, it's very, very expensive. Uh, so basically when you work with the, uh, the, those mm, asynchronous calls, you want to do all those things, all those waiting without creating additional threads. And for that, you need to do asynchronous things. You need to call back and you do not want to use blocking calls. Blocking call is a synchronous call. Blocking call is when you wait for somebody. And if you wait for somebody, you need to use thread. So basically in courses, you do not use blocking calls. There are some exceptions like uh, database, uh, but uh, in general, this one is bad because this one blocks the thread it's working. So in course, instead we use a function called delay. Delay is the uh, similar thing to uh, thread sleep. It waits for some time, but it does not block the thread. It means that if something is happening here, it will just uh, yield the resource, resources, the computing power, etc., to other tasks and will wake up when the time expires. So let's do it this way. It, it, it's the same. And it is the same because we are uh, uh, waiting for this process to, to be finished. Let us, let us do it another way. And for example, launch several processes simultaneously. Let's create a new cell. Again, I need to run blocking and run blocking is the entry point to your Horton world. The thing is that inside all those functions are suspending functions. And you will, if you will open them in idea, you will see this chords and symbol to left. Uh, and you can't, uh, uh, the chords in, uh, in some, in some sense, the chords in, uh, is working backwards in time. So first you will, uh, if you see the here, let, let, let me get back to this callback uh, thing. Let's see here, 
when we are doing these callbacks, we are somehow walking back in time because in order to execute function which uses a callback, you need to decide to first write a callback. So first you write a block of code which will work the latest. This is the problem. In coroutines, you are uh, writing them sequentially, uh, but <clears throat> uh, still, in order to these different timelines to converge, you need to work either in coroutine in world or in regular world. This around blocking it blocks current thread, I mean this uh, data lower thread, and uh, enters the coroutine world. Uh, let's write several uh, simultaneously working processes. For that, we will just create a list of jobs and say uh, val jobs equals uh, like for jobs map. Again, I'm using I'm using uh, this nice uh, standard library function. Map is uh, just uh, this is range from what, zero to four. It's a similar thing in Python. Um, map just uh, creates a list of values uh, where this function is applied to each of these elements. So it, uh, it will be a number of the line. We can just create a printing, uh, uh, creating job uh, it. And then I'm doing a launch here. And I'm uh, telling it uh, delay um, 100. And then I'm saying after you wait, just print uh, um, job um, finish it. Okay. <clears throat> and I've created those jobs, uh, they're started. And if I'm running it, I'm seeing sequential thing here, it's as expected, but let us do something different and do it uh, and measure the time. Uh, and uh, just there is no how to formatting in uh, uh i data. think uh, yes yes probably is. it is better than in jupyter but but it's still uh maybe there, maybe there is i i need to check a cake, mm -hmm. uh, case as i said i do not usually work with it, but it's pretty nice uh, Um, okay, let's run it. Aha. See, <laughs> I've started those jobs and those st timelines started, but I did not wait for them to finish. So I first executed this thing and then they're finished asynchronous. If we want uh, for them to wait for them and then i need to add jobs uh, wait uh, join all and in this case in this point i will wait i will suspend function not block the thread but set a waiter so i will wait uh, for all this work to finish and only then use this print as a callback to this action where we wait for all of them and let us see and you see the problem here. I have a four jobs, uh, five, sorry, five. And each of them takes 100 millisecond. But I have only 100 millisecond in the result. This is the idea. Uh, of course, uh, there is a little trick here uh, because uh, <clears throat> I don't know what, what environment do I use. Actually, uh, coroutines, default coroutines, they use, uh, uh, we, we can just um, see the difference and use this blocking method instead and see if the result is different. 
and you see the result is different. So uh, the idea is that it, uh, the, the court in the synchronity is ideal when you have a lot of waiting. For example, you send a request and wait for the response. And in this case, you can wait without additional mm, costs. Uh, if you use a blocking call, then still you are the same. You are doing it. Uh, in this case, we are doing it sequentially. And uh, we need a lot of time to do this. And we, there is even some kind of overhead, like six milliseconds for all this machinery to work. But if you are doing a waiting, then it's ideal. You save a lot of time. Uh, it's not only the web. Or web. Uh, for example, we are now working on the um, Monte Carlo engine simulation, which utilizes this a lot. Because in, uh, you, when you have, a, for example, a poor particle, you have a computing the trajectory uh, different particles uh, have uh, require different time to compute and if you want to do this in parallel it's not good to wait for some uh, processes to finish you want to use this like a tree like process like you want to uh, utilize your cpu as soon as the process finished computing so the asynchronous model is still very good for those things uh, but let us do another trick here. We're using broken process, so it will emulate our computations, heavy computations, and we will actually switch to parallel mode. Let us do this. Uh, okay, I have a very strange number now. Do you have some ideas why it is so? It's not it's not 500, it's not 100, but it's a 300. Why? I don't know, maybe because of your CPU in particular? Yes, that is... exactly, exactly. If we see uh, 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 some, where is, uh where is it somewhere here i i will have to see what what numbers of cpu i have in this data or instance i think it's in the home if you go if you open on another tab and go in the okay, home okay, you can see yeah. the machine yes yes uh, i i i will see the machine this notebook is running on uh, no, maybe not no 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 maybe not okay uh but anyway uh it, it's exactly this we actually running all these processes in parallel. I will explain what, what I did right now. Uh, but uh, this data lore instance, maybe, maybe here. Oh, I, I can check it later. This data lore instance has only two cores. It means that, or four cores, actually four cores. So when, or not. So it, it, has, it has a limited number of cores. So I can run only like two processes in parallel. Ah, yeah, two cores covered. So uh, first two, then first, uh, second two, then the fifth one. So if I use a five, it should do the same result. Uh, yes, and if I do a six, it, it should increase. Yeah, exactly. So it's a two cores. We, we, made, we just made it an experiment. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is exactly a showcase how you can use coroutines to do parallel computation. What happens here? When you create this uh, coroutine with lunch, uh, the, there is a thing called coroutine dispatcher, which, uh, and you can read it in the documentation again. Ah, I, guess, I, I guess I found, but there is no, nothing about the CPU. If you go on run, I can see change machine. Uh, yes, yes, uh, but, but it's more, much more or less the same. Uh, two CPU mm. but di different uh, memory. So it's a two, two CPUs. Uh, in my home computer, it will be the same because I have 12 threads uh, or something on uh, my Ryzen uh, processor. So if you, you can go to the Kotlin, Kotlin documentation here, it's a very comprehensive documentation. It's on Kotlin site called Kotlin guide. And <clears throat> this, 
this one, quality contacts and dispatchers. And you can see a rather comprehensive explain explanation of what dispatcher is doing and different dispatchers we are working on. And you see that there's a uh, four predefined uh, dispatchers. By default, we use run blocking. So we use a single thread dispatcher. Run blocking blocks single thread and uses this thread to run all the core teams inside. Uh, default uses uh, a thread pool with a number of threads equal to the number of your cores. So it, it is uh, very good to ut fully utilize your uh, core. It's not a good idea to run heavy computations on default because if you need to do something else in your program and then you use default by default and all the cores or all, all the threads are fully uh, loaded with your computation task, you can't do anything else. So if you're running heavy computations, it's a good idea to create your own dispatcher and that's quite, quite easy to do. But uh, in general, if I want to just to check uh, parallel computations, I use default. And this is what exactly I've done here. If I see documentation, sadly, I probably know documentation here yet. Um, it is, this is the main problem right now, the Jupyter plotting kernel. It doesn't have uh, the, the documentation hints. Maybe, oops, maybe, uh, no, no documentation, as you see. So it's a function signature, with, but without um but without uh, sadly without uh, documentation uh i've switched this environment i've added this context element and i switched this environment to multi-thread mode in this case when i launch new thread here uh i launch it on a free thread it's not necessarily a new thread but it, it has some kind of algorithm which dispatches new coordinates on threads and uh, so it starts new histories, it starts new threads and uh, doing all that in parallel. When I say join all, I just wait for all those jobs to finish. And this is how you do, uh, by basic, uh, basic um, way of doing uh, parallel computation with coordinates will look like this. Uh, I'm probably, oh, well, well, well this is one I can rewrite it to use, uh, for example, not uh, jobs, but use results. Uh, for that, I use uh, results and oops. And I will use not lunch, but a different function called async. Uh, and I will return uh, uh, oops and I will return for example I will return the uh, number of uh, Oh, let, let us return. Let us return the actual time spent in this uh, job like we did before. Uh, time in job. Uh, unlike Python, you do not need to, to think a lot about the names because uh, different lexical scopes have their own scope names. So uh, this thing is not seen inside here because it is defined after this one is executed. So in Python, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, there, there is no such thing as uh, dynamic namespace in Python, it's much easier. Uh, anyway. Uh, yep. Oops. Uh, and we'll return time. Time and job. Yes. It still works the same because uh, I just uh, because uh, the thing uh, the important thing about Kotlin uh, the only thing I probably can't do 
uh, just here from data lore is that it's not a language feature, it's a library feature. Uh, to check this, we need to go to um, documentation. Oh, it is here. Let us check it. And uh, da, 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 da. here it is. And we have uh, actual uh, this async function. We can search for it. Yes, here it is. And you can see the signature of this function. It's not. It's not a language feature. It's a function. It's a function which takes uh, some additional arguments, which are optional. But what's important, it takes this block. So it takes a function, suspended function, as an argument, and returns what we call deferred. Deferred is like a promise in JavaScript or in Python. It's an object. It's a handler for the result, which can be used later to cancel. By the way, we can cancel uh, computations uh, in Fortins. But in this case, it also holds the result. So in this case, uh, we can, for example, do something with result. If, if I may, this is also quite important. Another important difference between um, curtains and thread. The, the thread are generally hard to like terminate and so on. You need to implement yes, some yes. logic yourself yes. and so on. Yes, I do not have time today to go to details, but in Cortians, you actually have a very uh, robust way of cancellation of uh, subgraphs of tasks. Uh, uh, there is an object here, with, so this run blocking, if we see it in idea, you will see that um, we can just uh, see the object which implicitly passed through this Lambda, it's called Cortian scope. And we can do it while scope, coroutine scope, uh, and we will see it. Uh, this this scope uh, governs how those uh, things inside is executed. And if you have some kind of year inside, then um, it will propagate year. For example, it will cancel all computations will, which are dependent on this one so if you have a, a year or somewhere in the middle you don't have to wait for everything to finish to see that you have a, an exception and you can also evaluate it. A, a lot of advanced things here but i can do everything in one hour so let's see what happens here now i am returning result and uh, i am printing it Again, I am using this MapReduce uh, thing. Sum of is a standard library function. You can Google it up, which uh, takes a list. And the, here we have a list of job of uh, deferreds and performs this operation on each of them and sums the result. Probably should work. Yeah, it is working. And you see this which is perfectly fine. If we sum all the times in those jobs, we will see 50, 500 milliseconds and if the total execution time. And if we go back to delay, we'll probably see the same result here, but different here. Yes, exactly. So you see uh, this one, is done exactly after 100 milli. So it's, there is no trick here. Each of these operation took 100 milliseconds. And the total execution time is also 100 milliseconds. And you used only one core. But uh, of course, it uh, works this way only because this one is empty. It's, it's just waiting for something. OK. So. I do not have, a, I'm not sure how much time do we have. Uh, uh, we're almost hour here. And I can talk to you about the structured concurrency, which is the cancellation, propagation of cancellation coroutines. It's a little bit, probably a little bit more advanced topic. Uh, I'm not sure we should. Uh, probably I 
it is better to we we can try and then if anyone wants to leave he just can leave uh, i have another topic maybe it is more is more important right now and we will return to uh structured concurrency later it's uh, reactive streams it is very in, uh, very important pattern of design um, i'm not sure does anybody here is familiar with reactive stream please raise your hand nobody uh well probably it is important to talk about it uh, anyway uh you see uh well, let's start with uh first of all in case i forget uh, if you want to better understand how coroutines work uh, some design there are uh, very nice articles by roman yulizarov who is now a head of Kotlin development before that he was a head of libraries and and he actually created his coroutines library and uh, you can see a lot of these his publications here on medium just google up yelizarov and medium and very nice articles on that so you can use them to just understand how things work now <clears throat> now now let us go to uh, uh, this reactive stream thing because it is important uh, pattern which used everywhere in uh, microservices in uh, mobile development in uh, web backend and web front end so it is important for scientists to understand it right now we are using it for example to device for device communication and uh, i find that not a lot of people know what it is this technology is there for like 12 years but but uh, it's not very known inside the scientific community so it is important uh, let's go to reactive uh, Reactive programming, for example, this will be a uh, uh, Wikipedia article. And we can go, probably it has a link to Reactive Manifesto. Um, and it's bad, probably easier. Uh, it's probably easier to Google it up directly. So the reactive manifestos, you see it at 2014. Uh, I've actually started to work on similar system before that, uh, but the idea is that, um, you can read it up in a lot of text here, but the idea is that uh, you work not the, the sequence of actions, but the sequence of data. Uh, I'm not sure. If can Google up this nice visualization. My memory. Uh, maybe flow marbles. Yeah, there it is. So uh, this is also a nice, nice site with a nice visualization of how uh, different um, data flows work. So the reactive stream is made around the data. So you have some kind of data stream. It could be a simulation stream, for example, or some data stream from network. You're getting online data or whatever. And then the idea is not to collect all the data and then evaluate it, but do some operations as soon as a reaction to this data event. This is why it is reactive. So you get the uh, get the um, element, and here is the, for example, here is the uh, uh, Kotlin code, which um, evaluates this uh, thing. For example, you need in this case you work with the only even uh, then events with the even value. You get all these events, you have this stream, and then you have a similar stream in a different history. I mean, it's it's a parallel history. It's a parallel coroutine. And it creates this stream, which emits only even numbers. And you can even play around, for example, like this, uh, and work how this things works. And uh, you can not only filter things, uh, you can also do a lot of things. For example, you can do limit number. You can do um, 
random sampling. You can do um, well, what are operations? Oh, yeah. a merge two streams together. It's a typical thing. You have a two different data sources and you merge them together. Uh, filter, yes, it's the same. Filter instance is it's actually a very interesting thing because you can even if you have different types of messages, you can filter uh, you, uh, to to use only specific messages and you will know because you use this filter instance you will work on you do not have to do a explicit type conversion uh, to work with them after that uh, the index zip uh, combine two streams together and again you can play a little bit with it so this is very important pattern and again i do not have a, a, this much time to explain it in the detail but let's start with uh, back, get back to our um, uh, playground and create a number of uh, this reactive stream ourselves. For that, again, we need to enter the coordinate world because no coordinate operations could be done outside the coordinate world. We need this scope you know, to come from somewhere, this coordinate scope. And we do this run blocking again. In uh, general, you won't ever do this run blocking more than once in an application, more bit way. You just enter this course in world and then you will live in it. But in this case, uh, we need to set it up in each cell, of course. So let's create a flow. Wow, flow equals flow. Uh, and now we need to populate this flow with something. Let's just uh, do it with uh, sequ sequential numbers. And we do it like this. We do it like bar counter equals zero. And then with a while, ah, what have I done? It's an infinite cycle. And we do emit uh emit uh counter plus plus it's an infinite cycle never did that you have probably never done this and it's okay it is not freedom so everything working uh the thing is that the flow is lazy it's getting populated as soon as you consume uh things from it so unless you are not consuming it's okay uh let us now do a consummation of this flow and we will do it like uh, uh flow take um 10 and then uh we do it on collect for example we can do this and uh This could be a problem with it. Yeah, no, it's working fine. So I've created an infinite flow, but only, and I can just check it that I do not create additional elements. Let's let's just um, add additional uh, debug printing uh, here, and we say emit. Uh, let let do it. Ah, okay. Uh, counter. It's uh, by the way, I haven't said what I'm doing. It, it's called uh, string interpolation Kotlin. There are uh, some modern language have it. It's very convenient. I think if you want to use a, a variable from your code and put it into a string, it is just like that. And we will see surprise. So this things are not collected anywhere. They're emitted as soon as they, I consume an, a reaction to consumation of uh, the thing. This, this is exactly what, what about lazy computation. And you can, you, for example, in KMath, it's a library we are working, we're doing for compu scientific com computations, we are doing the random number generation and sampling via flows because it's ideal. You do not need to think how many numbers will you have. You just 
uh, keep pushing them to this pipeline and they are computed only when you need them uh, so and we can do some nice things for example we can do um, drop um, 10 and then take 10 it will mean that the 10 starting with a 10 and then we can do uh, like uh, filter filter uh, it uh, the same thing filtering only even numbers oops what was that ah double dot okay uh, you see uh, the, the, the surprising here is that you do not even, well, it, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're emitting those numbers, okay, of course, but you, you are not consuming them. Uh, and you actually can do things like this, emit pairs. Ah, yes, now, now, a uh, uh, little bit strange. Okay, still. Uh, Sorry, Alexander, I don't know if you saw, but there is a question from such. Okay, yes, please, please. Yeah, so um, emitters, like the yield in the Python? Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, there is a even very similar construct in Kotlin called sequence. Let me just show you. Uh, the sequence doesn't require a correction world. Um, and it actually works the same way. Mm, the difference will be that uh, you need to, you need to use yield instead. Uh, instead of, um, and again, it will work the same. It's a lazy sequence. Uh, this one is a full equivalent what you have in generators in Python. The difference is that this one, it uses coroutine mechanics inside, but it is not coroutine. So it's not actually asynchronous. For example, in flows, you have, you can uh, make it parallel. You can uh, send those events on different threads. You can, um, cancel it like you can cancel any uh, curtain a lot of other things sequence is much more limited it works exactly as the uh, python um, generator but uh, actually we can uh, do i believe that we can do all the same things with the sequence at least let us try no you can't Some, something was wrong uh Okay, that, that makes me wonder. So sequence is a keyword in Kotlin? No, 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 no. It's, it's that, again, it's a function. You can, mm -hmm. you can Google it up and just uh, Kotlin sequence. Uh, yeah, I believe it will be a lot of, mm, okay, let's try it. It will be general documentation probably. probably. Uh, let us find them. Uh, let us find, uh, yeah, here it is. Ah, oh, here is a reference to the condition. As you can see, again, it's a, it's just a function. Okay. In Kotlin, you have almost no language constructs, very little, very small number of language constructs. Almost everything is done as functions. All right, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm completely unfamiliar with Kotlin. Yeah, yeah, so it's okay. <laughs> We, I'm just explaining, maybe, maybe I'm explaining a little bit complicated things, but uh, we need to start with something. And I, I promise to uh, explain curtains. Uh, some problem here, I'm not sure. Uh, what happened? Hmm. 
Hello, collect. Ah, not collect for each. Yeah, okay. And it will work. Oh, now it's working. Uh, yeah, as I said, sequence is uh, very similar to flow, but flow is a much broader concept. It has a more overhead. So sequence is uh, just a, this uh, straightforward generator and the flow is a reactive stream with all this support for all this uh, asynchronous uh, operations as well. Uh, what a, uh, uh, so can, can we say that like uh, sequence is more like the thread dot keep and the difference is more like delay or mm -hmm. I, I can't use delay in a sequence mm -hmm. no so, I, I'm, in terms of behavior I, I was thinking like sequence is more blocking whereas the yes yes flow, yes flow is asynchronous. okay yes yes uh, sequence is actually blocking this thing until uh, Sequence is actually inside, it's, it's just transformed into the cycle. So sequence is like a cycle. Uh -huh. uh, Sorry, uh, a cycle? Yes, yes. Uh, if you, if you, look ah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And the result, Sorry. it will be like cycling through these numbers. Mm -hmm. But the idea is the same. This one is not computed. So this, uh, this here and this here are suspending functions. If we see again the, the documentation, you will see the suspend and this function, which we called uh, yield, is also suspending function. Which was susp the word suspend means that when you call the suspending function, it is possible that at this point, uh, your uh, your computation will suspend, not not block, but suspend and wait for something to to be finished. Uh, the core uh, sequence is a little bit confusing because uh, they are using uh, compiled mechanics for coroutines, but they are not full coroutines. For example, I can use a delay here. For some reason, it does not put proper uh, offset, and it will work, and here it won't work. It's a restricted suspending function can only be invoked in member. Uh, so it, it says that, yeah, you're using suspended function, but it's not a proper suspending function. So I can do this, all this dispatching and uh, all the other things uh, I'm doing with the flow here. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, you probably can see a lot of uh, articles about sequences versus lists because as, as well as Py is in Python, you can evaluate uh, blocks of data, lists, and you work with the lazy sequences. In most cases, by, uh, by the way, the working with lists is faster. And just because even remembering that those operations are lazy and to for lists, you need to create um, a list for each operation, like in Python again, but still, in most cases, it's faster to do it with list because this is how the processor prefetch uh, works on uh, our personal computers. It is easier for uh, your PC to copy a block of 10 numbers than to copy uh, five numbers one by one. Mm -hmm. So, we're more than an hour in this meeting, and uh, I think it could be a little bit overwhelming for people not familiar with the Kotlin and the synchronicity. I can spend a bit of time talking about structured concurrency, if you want, uh, about cancellation. What do you think, Giuseppe? We can, we can give it a try. Okay, I, I will just... Otherwise, because it's the it's recorded, so we can. Okay, uh, it is not see. a simple concept in the, for people to who work with it uh, because it uh, requires some time to get familiar with. But I will try to explain the basics. As I already said, the one of the important things in the concurrent uh, in the mm, synchronous programming is the uh, 
controlling of years. If you ever ask people who work with the distributed computing, they will say that the most it's not problem to do a distributed data flow. It's not a problem. The problem is when some of your computation nodes reports an error. And this is exactly the same for asynchronous computing. Uh, for example, let us see, um, let us create a tree of uh, coroutines. One launches and then it uh, launches. Uh, uh, then let's see. Mm. I don't remember. Where, uh, okay, let let us do this way. I'll call it parent job. Uh, and created two children jobs, child child one and child two. Mm -hmm. oh, and do the same here. It doesn't really matter what time I put here. And uh, in parent job, we will just so do it like this. Join. Uh, I can uh, join them separately, but in this case, I'm uh, saving one line of code and creating a list of those to job and uh, join them together. It's just a, it's not the most effective trick, but uh, sometimes you will see uh, things like this in Kotlin code. So uh, mm, let's let's run it. Yeah, everything's fine. Now let us assume that something happens inside one of these child children job. Uh, this result. Mm, when we are doing join, we expect that we depend on all both of those things. Uh, maybe we can. Oh, okay. So here we're using the results of both of the jobs. We can do uh, this async and explicitly use results. If you want, we can do it. Probably, maybe, maybe, maybe it is even better. We will just uh, return one here. The last statement in the lambda is a return result. I believe it's something like this in Python. I'm not sure. The, the, the last statement of the block is the result of the block. I usually tend to uh, still uh, write um, qualified return in order to for better readability, but it's not but it's not uh, required. And now let us uh, do something like this. Uh, in, uh, mm, child job one. Uh, await plus child job two await yeah now we do not need to join them explicitly because we are we are calling this await we are waiting uh, we are suspending until all the results are finished uh, yeah everything's fine and you can see this this is works perfectly fine as well uh, now let us assume that something went terribly wrong somewhere in between here for example and the uh, in the middle of execution something broken uh, here for example uh, we are using 50 and then say uh, roll or even we use an internal uh, Kotlin standard library function and call it user error So here, here it happens. This code is never executed. Let's try it. Ah, oh, okay, we see this error exception here in the lot of things. But what is important? We never uh, 
maybe year is too expressive because it a, a, a lot of a lot of uh, text here. Let's uh, use cancel instead. Cancel is a mm, more polite way of uh, canceling a task. It's a, uh, it means that it won't throw the exception, but it just canceled execution of this task. Oops. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I need to put so called uh, suspension point. Okay. Uh, as you see, uh, this work is finished. But this work is not finished, and this work is not finished, so it's canceled. Uh, we can, for example, and uh, by by the by the way, for some reason we we did not get. Uh, actually, we had exception here because this line is never executed, so we have exception. But this is where it gets a little bit tricky because uh, this job is actually canceled. Mm. Let me try something. Yeah, now now this is cor correct one because uh, you see, I now have an exception. Why is that? Because I can c compute this uh, thing because one of the jobs when I call, try to call a wait on this one, uh, I get an exception. It's like a cancel action exception, so the, the work, work is, job is not working. Uh, but the first job is still completed. Now, let us do it the way I've done the first time. I'm using not a cancellation, which is normal work for the task. I use a year. You see, uh, I also get an exception, but I do not have a message about completion of this work. What happens? Uh, it's a normal thing because if something is working inside my very complicated uh, asynchronous workflow, I do not want to do the work uh, I have not paid for. So th this, this thing is meaningless unless I get this result as well. So what happens here? When I get a year here, uh, this year propagates to parent coroutine scope, which is here. I remind you, this is a parent scope, scope here, and it cancels the parent scope. And then the parent scope cancels. Every its child, every of its child children are also also cancelled. So when this is broken, it cancels parent, and the parent cancels this one. So you do not job. Uh, which is meaning uh, you do not do work, which is meaning this. Of course, doing it the proper way and understanding how the messages propagate from child children coroutines to uh, parent coroutines and how proper uh, understand this takes some time. It's not that simple, sadly. It is much more simple than, for example, an MPI in C++ uh, because uh, at least you have some kind of order. You, you, you understand how different levels of coroutines interact with each other. Uh, but still, it's not simple. <laughs> and they, they take some time to get familiar with. Uh, maybe I can also show you additional uh, thing. Let us remove this. Alexander, um, there is also uh, ask uh, something else. Uh, if the bugging and calling is difficult. OK. What 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 is this? Uh, I guess regarding um... ah okay uh, yes I, I see the debugging. Uh, so if you do not go to the coroutines, debugging is perfect. If you ever worked with Java, it's exactly this, almost the same. There are some issues with the inline functions, but mostly it is very easy and it's much easier than in Python, and it's definitely much 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 easier than in C plus plus. So it's perfectly fine. You can attach debugger to any process. Actually, I can attach debugger to this process as well. We can mm, debugger will be complicated, but uh, I can attach profiler. Let me just do it. 
if I have it on this computer. Let me try. Just sadly, I'm not sure I have it. So, uh, in any case, you can just attach a uh, debugger and um, and uh, um, provider to any uh, Kotlin process, which is also it's a Java process, and debug it, and it is perfectly fine. And I think they almost get the debugger working on the Kotlin Jupyter as well. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated with core chips, since, as I said, the core chips, uh, you write them sequ sequentially, but the actual code is uh, other way around. So uh, when you rewrite it with uh, callbacks, the code below appears above, uh, uh, and there is a lot of inner machinery, some deep computer science, which I do not understand how it works exactly. Uh, to make a proper order, the debugging of core teams a little bit more complicated. Still, in in idea, if you do it in idea, you get almost exactly the same experience as you get uh, while debugging regular sequential code. Maybe I can just demonstrate since I have this project loaded, and just let us uh, do some new Kotlin class and uh, okay let it be file and call it demo and I'm just creating this main method here it is and I can even make it suspend main method which means I do not need to go into the curtain world I'm starting in it and and then I'm doing like uh Uh, I do not need to print type because the type inference uh, in uh, your library code, you usually have to still, it's preferable to use uh, types because it's uh, easier to read and easier to debug. But um, A, and what I can do, I can just run it. It will take some time because it still need to compile uh, this um, Java, Java GVM class files. It should be pretty fast, nonetheless. But the first run takes some time. Yeah, here it is. And now we can just play debug and just run it in debug mode. Yeah, please. Yes. And here we are. We can see the variables here. And we can, in most cases, we can even. Uh, um, we can uh, this one. I'm not sure it will work, but probably it will because it's because some of it's inline function. Yeah, it's work. You, you can compute things here um, and you can do a lot of other things, uh, whatever you want. And you can, of course, you can. Uh, in this case, I have only one step, but I can step here and start debugging. And then I would, can uh, walk steps like that. And even if I have uh, things like uh, those, yeah, map, uh, it, for example, like this, I can place a breakpoint here, and I will enter it three times. So the first one, it is one, and the second one, it is two, and the third one, it is three. So uh, the debugging experience in GV GVM world is the best. Uh, it only could be compared to the Google developer tools for JavaScript, but JavaScript itself is not very nice. So yeah, debugging experience is very good. <laughs> You can even, in, in, if we are talking about idea, you can even make a conditional breakpoint like it, uh, and it will hit it only once. So it is very, uh, it is a thing I did not know until recently, but it's very convenient if you're searching for a very rare, rare bug in the data, uh, someone like a three million element from the start, it's, it's very convenient, you see. 
some other questions. Or also, if I may, just when you want to, I always found myself that I, I, I discovered this too late, when you want to break on some point, only when you hit another breakpoint, you can also implement dependency between breakpoint, like yeah, if you yeah. go on more, uh, yeah, yes, I, I'm not even, uh, there this are lots of things cool. I, I never used here, so it's, it's uh, like it's disable huge. until hitting the following breakpoint, uh, and that yeah. in the center, and that you can yeah. you can set dependencies. Yes, it's it's uh, I, I it's very powerful, need. but it's better always to 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 invest to invest some time into knowing your tools. Yeah, it's a, lo a lot of tools here. Uh, there are actually a tremendous amount of tools. For example. Uh, some, if you're going for some advanced performance, people, for example, use um, something like this. Hard uh, core programmers just do it in assembler. It's not assembler, it's a Java bytecode, but uh, still uh, <laughs> you can do this as well. Yeah. yeah. I think we are out of time, even if we take one and a half an hour. So if there are some questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And of course, as I said, it's not possible to explain even all the core teams in one hour. It's just a very uh, large area. The um, coding co concept exists only in like uh, C sharp, I guess. Uh, no, nowadays coroutines are everywhere. They're even in Dart language, and uh, there is a sync await uh, in JavaScript, in Python as well, and they're even introduced in C++. I don't remember if it's C++ 17 or C++ 20. They're a little bit different, and I, again, I urge you to uh, see talks by Raman Elizarov. Uh, not, not, not to those articles, but talks where he compares uh, coroutines in different languages. Uh, I think right now in Kotlin it's uh, the most advanced coroutine things because uh, other languages like Dart or even Go started to copy features. Go was the, I think the one, the first one who implemented this asynchronous primitives uh, on the language level, but they do not have the structured concurrency. And now they are trying to copy uh, structured concurrency from Kotlin. What is the next question? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, but but in C plus plus still C plus plus has a tremendous amount of features. But for example, uh, it, it is very hard to navigate. Even you take lambdas, you can do lambdas in C plus plus, obviously, but it's not as convenient as something like this. <laughs> you need to have to write explicitly what what uh, variables do you capture in C plus uh, plus. It's yeah, this is also something that uh, also Java cannot do quite easily, like Kotlin. Like uh, when you need like uh, to, you can capture all your final variable, I guess. Uh, and... Java Java is mostly relaxed for those things, so you can do things almost as you do in Kotlin and Java. Uh, it requires some additional um, ceremony because the syntax is not so nice. This syntax is actually come came from Groovy. Uh, but most things you can do in Java. Kotlin, uh, yeah, Java is very nice language, but yeah, it's, it's old, so uh, Kotlin is better. Mm. It's advancing at its Yes, pace. yes, you, you, you just can't, uh, you can introduce new things to language, but you can't easily remove old ones. So you, you just can't, uh, Java was not created with the lambdas and uh, first class support for functions in mind. And even as a great language as it is, you can just put them there without uh, destroying something. This is also something that I love about Kotlin that they like. Um, I, I don't know in Java, you have also the feeling, always the feeling that they like more or less impose some theoretical idea on the on the on the on the language. In Kotlin, it's more like uh, you look what other what other language do. You look what the community ask and you try to shape uh, the feature around this these two uh, most of the two let's say needs something like that uh, to be exact uh, all uh, last generation languages like rust uh, julia swift uh, or even dart they have a more or less a similar syntax and similar amount of features 
uh, I think that uh, Kotlin my main uh, initially Kotlin main feature was the interoperability with the Java ecosystem. So you have a huge amount of libraries there, and now it's multi-platform, so it can use uh, uh, JavaScript libraries. I like I showed you Giuseppe with this plotly thing. Uh, and I think in future this Kotlin native will be more advanced. Like now, it's more or less uh, focused uh, on the iOS and mobile development. But I think in future it will have at least partial interop with the uh, interoperability with the C++ and it will allow it to use it in the very broad. Uh, uh, yeah, the libraries ecosystem and so on. Yes, yes. Mm. It will take off hopefully. Okay, if there are no other questions, then thank you very much, Alexander, for your time and You're welcome. for your talk. Yes, feel free to invite me again. If yeah, no yeah we will do. We have uh, other, there is a list uh, of things to discuss yet uh, that we can, we can continue. Okay, thank you, thank you very much and have a nice day all. Yeah. Bye-bye.